with the beef herd contracting in both the U.S. and Canada, one of the and I thought this name, you know, this number was mind blowing, but they estimated and they think it's underestimated that there's approximately between 2.5 and 5 million of these beef on dairy. And I assume that's also uh, there's going to be more because they're not accounting for the Holsteins that are still being placed. So only based on uh, semen sales, there's about between 2.5, which is a wide range and 5 million of these calves coming into the yard. So as you said, it's. It has, it's not been, you know, it's not a new trend. They've been placing uh, these steers since around, I mean, forever. They've always been part of a beef supply chain. But before they were uh, 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 veal right, or bobby calves. And then now, as you mentioned, like they because of the need of having the shortage of feeder cattle. So then now we're seeing this uh, massive influx and constant uh, supply of uh, calves coming from the dairies, which is a completely different story. The dairy herd has been stable for the longest time. So it's, it's great for both industries. Welcome to another episode of the Beef Podcast Show. My name is Dr. Stephanie Hansen. I'm a feedlot nutritionist at Iowa State University, and it is my pleasure to welcome a returning guest today, from uh, who is a veterinarian at Feedlot Health up in Canada. So we were comparing uh, snow stories before we hit the record button here. Um, so our guest today is Mariana Guerra Malpome, and uh, she works as a part of Feedlot Health up there in Canada, as I mentioned, um, and they are a really data-driven organization. So they work with research and producer data to try to help producers have a better return on investment. So she's got a team of others that she works with there to continually evaluate and target the most efficiency um, from the different uh, high quality vet services. They do a lot of work with implants um, and really prioritizing animal welfare. So she's a doctor of veterinary medicine and has a, a background in pathobiology as well. And she comes from Kansas State University. So welcome to the show, Mariana, or I should say, welcome back to the show. Welcome back. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah, I'm excited to be back. Yeah. Okay. So you've been on the show before, so produce, uh, listeners can go back and listen to some of your more detailed origin story, but um, maybe give us just a little bit of hint uh, about what you do up there with Feedlot Health. If um, They're a little bit different kind of organization, um, not just providing nutritional consulting, not just providing veterinary services, but a little bit more holistic kind of um, operation. So maybe tell us a little bit about that. Right. So um, the company here was bought so what we have uh, formerly would, uh, known as feedlot health management services was bought by telus agriculture so now we call ourselves uh, telus agriculture and consumer goods but we're still you know the same group of people so yeah as you mentioned um the company here is a consulting company that helps uh, producers uh both on the calf grower side and the feedlot side to find uh, strategies where they can maximize their revenue through uh finding solutions through nutrition, as you mentioned, different uh, implant strategies, different feed additives, uh, uh, health protocols, marketing strategies, different, really it's a holistic approach to how can we you know, help those producers to be more profitable. We have a time and labor saving product for you. Beef and Dairy Agrislat by Healthy Farms is your solution. No more lugging jugs around the barn every month. With Beef and Dairy Agrislat, you simply drop the slat through the floor twice a year and it works to break down solids, reduces crusting and forming. To learn more, visit MyHealthyFarms.com. Okay, so as we're recording this, this is uh, November of 2023, and we currently have the smallest U.S. beef herd. I don't know the numbers in Canada, but I understand the trends are pretty similar. Uh, we currently have the smallest U.S. beef herd since 1962. So we have less cows than ever before, and we uh, somehow recently had some increases in feedlot placements. So we know that heifers are moving into the feedlot. <laughs> so yeah. cow expansion has been slowed. Um, and one of the ways that we have, one of the opportunities we've had to fill that gap has been with the onset of the dairy beef cross. So um, as the dairy guys in the last couple of years have suddenly discovered the value of producing a calf that's half beef, um, that calf has made its way into our feedlots. And I understand that's probably a challenge and an opportunity that you've had to deal with quite a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, as you said, um, 
with the beef herd contracting in both the U.S. and Canada, one of the and I thought this name, was, you know, this number was mind blowing, but they estimated and they think it's underestimated that there's approximately between 2.5 and 5 million of these beef on dairy. And I assume that's also uh, there's going to be more because they're not accounting for the Holsteins that are still being placed. So only based on uh, semen sales, there's about between 2.5, which is a wide range and 5 million of these calves coming into the yard. So as you said, it's. It has, it's not been, you know, it's not a new trend. They've been placing uh, these steers since around, I mean, forever. They've always been part of a beef supply chain. But before they were uh, 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 veal right, or bobby calves. And then now, as you mentioned, they, they because of the need of having the shortage of feeder cattle. So then now we're seeing this uh, massive influx and constant uh, supply of uh, calves coming from the dairies, which is a completely different story. The dairy herd has been stable for the longest time. So it's, it's great for both industries. And it is a particular challenge because as they have, for example, bred a Holstein cow to an Angus bull of some indiscriminate EPD and genetic value, we have a black calf who maybe looks beef on the outside, but as we're going to talk today, I think we're going to learn he's maybe not all that beefy on the inside. So there's lots of implications and the genetics might be one of the places to start. Um, what do you think are some of the big, uh, I think we probably have more questions than answers. It'd be cool if you have some answers to some of those questions, but maybe at this point, what do you think are some of the questions that we need to figure out in the next several years when it just comes to thinking about what are these calves that are now in the feedlot? Yeah, so as you mentioned, uh, there's more, there's this, episode is going to bring more questions than, you know, as you said, answers. There's a lot of unknowns in the di in different uh, aspects of raising and feeding these calves. I think the most uh, uh, um, common topic that I hear would be the genetic influence. And probably a lot of people talk about the bull influence. So we have a lot of genetic companies working with the different large commercial feed yards trying to, to identify what's the ideal calf. So... Back in the day, I still remember, well, back in the day, like three years ago, I still remember seeing, you know, a black calf show up to the feedlot, right? And so we started feeding those calves and we realized that not all calves are made the same. There's some distinct uh, qualities that would make a calf that would be wanted by a packer versus a calf that would be, you know, just a black calf that would qualify for CAV. They still both qualify, but they're not going to perform similarly. They're not going to uh, have the same health outcome. So... I think the industry started to say, okay, how can we do things better? So they went back to, let's analyze the sires, as you were saying. People used to uh, um, use straws for bulls that were the cheapest bulls in the catalog or were the only ones that were left on the semen tank. And now we're going back to, let's really design or find a bull that's going to create a calf that's going to perform as, as, you know, ideal calf, right? So what I think one of the challenges is that um, it's not going to be only, the answer is not going to be only found on the bull. There's also a lot of dam influence. And so we've seen a lot of uh, repercussions when you combine or when you look at a Holstein dam versus a Jersey dam, even with the same bull. So a lot of uh, genetic uh, challenges, management challenges, health challenges, and performance challenges. Right? What's your what's your ideal? And let's define it ideal and how to get there. I almost wonder on this dairy beef deal if we haven't stress tested or pressure tested the system from the get go because, as you said, a lot of it at the beginning was using the cheapest semen available, cleaning out the tank, you know, whatever that stat is about how many millions of straws of beef semen were sold to the dairy herd three, four years ago, right? That are then those calves that came in. So we all kind of got that hot mess of variation and then introduce some of like the cool studies, you know, schools like Texas Tech and others are doing where they're trying to figure out like, how does muscle fiber type differ when you have this breed versus that breed combined together? Um, so I think, you know, it's, it was probably not great, right? That we kind of had to learn that stuff on the fly, but I do think maybe it did open up a lot of questions that we maybe would have been delayed on figuring out if we would have taken a, a slightly more directed approach into this dairy beef thing. And I think I think uh, the value of what you brought up is that those decisions were made by dairymen or ha have been made by dairymen. They don't know what we expect 
that uh, from that calf once it gets placed in the feedlot. So I think it brings the door to, uh, uh, to conversations and I mean, the beef on dairy represent that alignment or should represent the alignment between the dairy and the beef industry. So we need to start talking to the dairy man and say, this is what I expect. And so basically, I mean, this is the, the semen that I want you to be using, right? This is the calf that I'm going to buy. So it's an, you know, it has to be back and forward all the time. They shouldn't uh, have the, the, you know, the sole decision of the uh, genetic merit, merit of those calves. Absolutely. And of course, in the beef industry, we are so good at talking to each other. Oh, yeah. I'm sure if we brought mm -hmm. another industry in, it'll go smashingly. <laughs> yeah. You know, but at the end of the day, as you mentioned, I mean, th those calves bring revenue to the dairy and there's a value added for being a beef on dairy calf. So um, and I think it's a win-win situation if we know how to collaborate together. Absolutely. And I, I do wonder if we get to the point where the feedlots say, you know, the dairy beef especially if they were not an operation who had had success feeding purebred Holsteins before. It seemed like those guys have made the transition better, right? Because they already knew some of the weirdness that comes with feeding a dairy calf in the feedlot. But, you know, for those of us that had never messed around with any dairy crosses and actually swore that we would never feed anything black and white that wasn't, a, you know, a baldy <laughs> yeah. um, in the feedlot, right? It, we were slower to learn boy, these guys come with some challenges, um, you know, and, and that, that dairy person gets that feedback to say, well, I'm not going to buy this from you anymore because there's too many challenges. You know, is the feedlot person willing to have empty hotel space um, yeah. versus not filling it with a calf that might come with a high degree of risk? Yeah, and I would say that's one of, you know, the benefits of um, for beef and dairy is that they're not usually fed in smaller feedlots. They're usually fed in uh, specialized units where usually these commercial feedlots take on the challenge because they have a team that can support, you know, the, the fine tuning of the protocols, the nutrition of those calves. So it's those calves require a highly specialized uh, teams and not only, you know, at the feedlot, but also at the calf or it's not something that you can just wing and bring them, you know, to your yard really, it's, we, we don't see that often. Well, perfect. So let's talk a little bit about that. So when you talk about this team of specialized, I'm, I'm picturing like, like a medical team, right? And maybe that's not too far off the mark when it comes to dairy beef crosses, right? So like, who are the members of this team, if you're thinking about sort of a specialized commercial yard that says, I'm going to raise dairy beef, and I'm going to try to do it successfully? Who are the members of those teams? Um, and what do you think are some of the unique kind of needs of these calves? So you have to have, um, it all starts with the people, right? It all gets done through the people. So I, I wouldn't take on a challenge of helping a producer that wants to feed uh, beef on dairy without working closely with a nutritionist, right? There's so many challenges that come and can be fixed through proper nutrition. So working together, um, developing protocols. So of course, a veterinarian, uh, and not only a veterinarian, but also somebody that's maybe not has the experience, but is willing to, to do things differently. Because although we manage at the feedlot, well, because we don't, of course, feed calf, beef calves in the calf grower, but al although we manage them similarly, so the protocols are gonna be really similarly, the outcomes are gonna be different. So higher morbidity and higher mortality. And then, um, so you have to always be, uh, tailoring and fine tuning those protocols to make sure that you're meeting the needs of those calves. They're really, they don't let you, uh, so you know how the, the epidemiology curve of a beef cattle, uh, calf behaves, right? The first 40 days, they're like, the, that's when you have to be, you know, on top of them, making sure they, you know, if they get sick, you treat, sick, you treat them. And then after that, it all kind of like slows down and they perform beautifully until they go to slaughter. These calves do not perform that way. These calves are constantly demanding uh, high, like high skilled attention, right? So you have to be, um, behind the data. I would say that one of the challenges and opportunities of feeding um, and back to what you know what it takes from a team is a team that's going to support and monitor data. It's all about data, data, data. So the people that's recording the data, the people that are analyzing the data and the people that are implementing the decisions that you know came through uh, looking at the data. So um, analyzing epidemiology, epidemiology curves, knowing you know when are they dying, 
who is dying and then what are we going to do about it? And then I think it's a really exciting area of research. Uh, definitely uh, lots of lots of improvement and it's a really quick paced research. We're always you know, trying to identify what's the best strategy. So again, going back to your question, I would say uh, a veterinarian, a nutritionist, ideally, you know, uh, somebody that's looking at your data, data integrity, and then with that comes, you know, a strong research team. And somebody, of course, the, the feedlot or the cow or staff that's going to be able to implement those uh, um, management decisions. This is a little bit of a side tangent, and I'll bring us back to our conversation here in a second. But I, as you were talking there, I was wondering, do you think that there's a place for the right kind of technology that could help? Because what you really was describing was that you need to have a labor force who's a highly skilled, you know, at identifying this sick animal who's maybe not showing you that he's sick or very subtly showing you that he's sick. Yeah, absolutely. And I was having this conversation yesterday with one of our uh, health staff here in, in Canada. Uh, ask, you know, what can he, what ter- technology can we develop for for you to have, you know, an easier time managing this calf? So that he's a, a pen rider. He goes through these calves every single day. He makes sure, you know, they're healthy. Uh, if they are sick, they, they get treated. And so, you know, I think, again, it comes back to the people. We can develop all these sensors, you know, these calves might look like Christmas trees with, like, activity sensors and rumination sensors and, like, temperature sensors. But at the end of the day, it really takes a skilled eye to be able to pick on these subtle differences. So you and I were chatting about it, uh, you know, before we uh, started recording. And there's a lot of controversy, but I think that if you spend time on a pen walking these calves, you will realize that your case definition of BRD, it's not going to be what you know for a beef animal. So in a beef animal, when I walk a pen, when I am doing herd inspections, I want to kind of check boxes, right? So depressed, it's not eating, uh, droopy ears, watery eyes. um, And with these calves, really one of those symptoms is enough for the calf to be already sick. So, you know, even just the slightest eardrop or, you know, just uh, not even, you know, they still, they're so sick, but they still come up to the bunk, right? So you can't go by just, uh, it's it's a combination, but at the same time, it is spending enough time for them. So that's when it comes with the skill labor, spending enough time for them, with them, sorry, and then, being able to pick on those subtle differences. So but going back to your technology question, there's been some studies that have proven to be effective on the hutch uh, stage. So in the calf grower stage where, you know, activity is important, temperature is important. Um, so I hope that we see that come through and there's, you know, some interesting tags there in the market. I hope we see that come through, but I think it's going to take a while and it's not going to be a silver bullet. It's, if anything, it's going to be, you know, there to help with the shortage of labor, but we will still have a really um, heavy uh, impact of, you know, who's, who's checking those cattle and who's treating those cattle. I wonder if there'll be an opportunity for, uh, so like generative AI right now, you know, things like chat GPT has just gotten to the point where it can read images. And then of course it can help generate images through things like mid journey. But I wonder, and you were talking about the ability of a human to be a good sickness detector, right? And say, oh, that calf's got a little bit of ear droop, but he's still up at the bunk, you know, and I'm looking at him a little bit more closely or his eyes aren't quite as bright as I would like to see. I wonder if technology from a visual learning perspective will get to that point where it'll be able to pick up some of those subtleties, especially if it's potentially able to see those animals more frequently and it starts to even say well this is usually what this calf looks like but today he looks different and he gets you know flagged to the pen readers our pen writers list yeah absolutely so they've done that in the not on the ai side of things so not really camera based but they've done that for a long time in the dairy industry where when they place activity monitors rumination monitors and the um they measure the electric i don't remember exactly on the milk so they can pick those sick ca- uh, cows about two days before the people that are walking those pens. 
So they are able to match both things, right? So the computer is flagging, you should check cow 606, right? So the guy goes out, makes sure, and yeah, sure enough, she's got, you know, high temperature, she has mastitis, higher high cell count, whatever. So they have to integrate both things. I don't see that happening at the feedlot just because the cost, I mean, I would only see that those technologies come through if the cost of those technologies were to be affordable. Um, there's one trial going on here in one of the yards and they have cameras placed on top of the chronic pen. Uh, and so they're monitoring activity in uh, the, the prognosis and performance of those chronic calves. And just looking at those cameras, I'm thinking, man, I mean, the calves here, the density of these pens, how are you going to even, you know, be able to pick up those subtle differences using a camera? So I would like to, you know, when, once those technologies go through uh, and end up in the commercial uh, stage, I would like to see how, how they perform in a, you know, densely packed uh, pen, especially the ones that we've seen with, uh, you know, the R uh, RCC, when we get more animals, you know, in, inside of the pen. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking just from a evolution standpoint and realizing that like intensive animal production has a relatively short time span of evolution, right? We're talking less than a hundred years in a lot of cases. Have we, has somebody else in the dairy industry selected for an animal who has this, Jody McGill would call him this loud immune response, right? This loud immune system that has this overzealous response to any kind of challenge, um, have they selected for an animal who is like, man, if you didn't catch him right away or catch her right away when she started to show some illness, she was just as likely to get really sick and then maybe cold and then didn't reproduce. And so, you know, we've kind of selected for this animal who's just sort of always experiencing some at least low grade inflammation. And then we're just hoping that we're there when they break and we can get on top of it enough, you know, quickly enough to save them. Does that sound crazy or do you think that no, could be? No, it doesn't sound crazy. Um, I, yeah, I know what you're getting there. We see that a lot when, when I was with in, in Jody's lab. Um, and I, again, it's like a lot of those unknowns, right? We, I don't know if we ever will find out, but it goes back to my point of there's as much damn influence as there is bull influence. So how can you separate both? I think it's, you know, almost impossible. What it's true is that the heterosis value, it's going to, you know, it's going to benefit us uh, in a better way than feeding straight Holsteins. Yeah, I think about that a lot too. Not only, like once we get the genetic thing figured out, you know, I actually kind of like personally this scenario where we get to the point where we take as much of the dairy out as possible and we're just putting like beef by beef embryos in yeah. dairy cows and they can just be incubators. You know, they're pretty they're not very good at getting bread to begin with, but they hold a calf fine. So yeah. just skip that part and let them carry a beef animal. And then I, we still would have nutritional implications, you know, things like the fact that they feed a lot of copper in the dairy industry. So we get calves who are born with a lot of liver copper and he maybe is still loaded with that liver copper when he comes to the feedlot epigenetic effects, right? Who knows what, you know, being in a dairy cow's uterus does to, you know, a calf, even if they are straight beef. So I think a ton of research questions are sitting there for sure. Yeah, well, that's some valid points. I've, I've read, have read that um, it, um, some people think, you know, addressing the herd contraction could be uh, could be accelerated through uh, embryo, you know, uh, transferred those uh, uh, dairy cows. I'm not sure if that's going to happen, but that's an interesting theory or solution. It is. It is. And especially since, you know, the dairy industry, you know, has been on sex semen way longer than the beef industry has been. Right. And actually, like side tangent, I would love to see the beef industry make some huge leaps forward in terms of our use of AI where where logistically possible sex, you know, heifer semen kind of thing so that we could, you know, potentially decrease this expansion from a three year event to maybe a little bit shorter than that, because I think mm -hmm. we're all going to benefit in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you've really set us up nicely here to make a transition. So we understand there's challenges with feeding this dairy beef animal when he gets to the feedlot. But a lot of that is completely out of the control of the feedlot nutritionist or manager. Let's back up a step and talk about where that beast is in his life right before he comes to the feedlot. So I understand this is an area you work in quite a bit up there in Canada. So tell us a little bit about the work that you do with calf growers and what do you think are some of the biggest opportunities there for them to help set this animal up for success in the feed yard? 
Yeah, so there's, you know, different ways that a calf can get to a uh, beef on the area or a dairy calf can get to the feedlot. And one of those um, streams would be, you know, straight from the dairy as day old. So that would be the, the most common scenario um, that I work closely with. Although I do work with them at the feedlot and there's many ways that, you know, sources that how they can get there. I think the most common one for me would be starting as day olds. Um, and... It is, you know, if you think about it, in, in this like, 18 month period where when they get to slaughter, right, between 16 and 18 months, that's when they would go, we would get shipped to the packing plant. And, and you want to intervene at the feedlot on the last, you know, 90 days or 100 days and have a result uh, in the carcass, uh, in the performance data or in the health data, then I think we're a bit late to the game. So, Definitely, we, we've tried different things and nothing has proved to be uh, the answer. So we believe, or there's a lot of information out there that people believe that really the highest impact is going to be if you go backwards and start a stay old. So even, you know, you and I were talking about the cow management, right? Cow status, herd status, herd vaccination. I mean, going back to the basics, did that calf receive colostrum? Uh, I would say if that calf didn't receive adequate colostrum, it's not going to set him for up for a good start. doesn't matter if you have Dr. Stephanie Jensen managing your diets, or it doesn't matter if you have Dr. Calvin Booker managing your health protocols. You know, it is really all about how we, you know, provide the um, colostrum to that cow, calf and basic husbandry uh, practices. I think that it all goes back to the basics, right? Um, it represented a challenge, has represented a challenge because of the low value of those calves initially. So it, um, even a welfare concern, really, you know, they were not well taken care of. Basically, you will drop on the ground and get immediately sent to these calf herders. As they have increased value, we've seen, you know, and you have to consider the beef and dairy um premium there but we've seen increases from you know a couple of years ago from 100 bucks to we were looking at 800 900 bucks a day old so people are starting to think maybe i do want that calf to survive because when milk prices are low i do want to still have revenue and that calf you know it's a great way to you know continuously provide revenue to that dairy so they're paying more attention uh, than ever to, you know, the management practices at the maternity pen, at the, you know, the cow level, making sure that calf is set for success and making sure that calf, you know, once it gets to the, the calf grower, um, we're constantly working with calf growers to, so they record the data, you know, the health data, the uh, failure of passive transfer data, and we are uh, giving feedback to those areas and being like, you know, that you need to improve on this aspect. We've seen a lot of diarrhea here. We've seen, you know, we usually blame them on the first 20 days. After that, we you, you know, we take responsibility of what happens to those calves. But most, I would say, of the calf growers is going to be that first 20 day period where they either, you know, survive or succumb. And it's all goes back to, you know, the management practices. And then after that, you know, your health protocols, making sure you have your um, crews trained uh, protocols in place. There's no uh, drift on protocols. They take a lot of attention to detail. Uh, and then management practices at the cover have proven to be so important. Based on milk, um, starter, how do you wean those calves and how do you, you know, manage them until they get to the feedlot. So I have seen some protocols from some calf growers, and sometimes there can be upwards of 20 different vaccinations that are listed in that, in that over a relatively short period of time. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on, you know, does the cure come through a needle or is it um, a piece of the package? Or especially as I'm thinking about animals who still have a lot of, in theory, maternal antibodies, if they had yeah. good um, colostrum and things like that. Yeah, so definitely a concern and me being, you know, my uh, background being an immunologist, it always like makes me cringe because if you think about a calf that actually received colostrum, you should be worried about, you know, when do you time those vaccinations, right? Especially, of course, the parental vaccinations because those are the ones that have, will have the most influence with the um, transfer with the uh, antibodies still in circulation. 
So yeah, definitely the industry standards is using more vaccines than I would like to think that the calf can tolerate or respond to or even get uh, damaged by those an antigens. So that was at the beginning. The people that I get to work with, uh, we fine tune those protocols to what works. So initially, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, give the vaccine at 28, you know, at like day 10. We know that the day 10 probably is not a good option. And then again at day 28, and then, you know, out of hutch, and then again at the reback in the corrals. And they really didn't change the outcome. I would say with these calves, we realized through different strategies, could be vaccination, could be treatment use, uh, antibiotic stewardship, probably less is more. Like not necessarily having, you know, the your metaphylaxis on top of your vaccination, on top of your castration, on top of um, totem protein, protein measurements is not going to be probably the best, you know, set up that calf for the best success. So we, I, I've seen the, a trend in the industry where we're going from uh, loaded protocols to let's just fine tune those protocols based on research. We, you know, what we need, it works. It's not just like I decide that today I'm just going to take, you know, the viral vaccine and start doing a uh, mucosal vaccine, but um, basing those decisions on solid data and the trends have been uh, moving towards, let's start removing protocol uh, products from their, uh, you know, treatment from their um, arrival protocols and putting more effort into what we feed those calves both uh, milk and the um, starter. Okay, so I don't know as much about the dairy side, obviously, but a couple of questions from just conversations with some folks on the dairy side. How often do you see like water being provided to calves during that, like an, in addition to the milk? Um, and do you think that there's value in that? And I understand that there's additional logistics with with offering that and keeping it clean and, and re replenished, especially in some of the colder climates. Yeah, definitely. So it all comes back to, you know, um, what can the operation do with a short, you know, the, there's only that many days in the, in the day and there's only that many people that can, they can hire or they're willing to work. So we can come up with strategies that might sound like this is going to fix all of our problems, but if the operation of the farm can get them done, I mean, there's really, you know, it's not a solution, right? It's just more of a problem, but definitely. So I've seen a lot of those calves that get shipped from the uh, dairy, they arrive to the calf brewer, and this is all related to season of the year. So higher, you know, during the summer, you see a lot of those calves come through uh, being highly dehydrated, like sunken eyes, like down, bad dehydrated, definitely really poor prognosis. Won't take long until you see these calves struggle. Um, so that happens a lot during the summer in hotter climates, a big problem in states like California, big problems in, in down in Mexico, we work quite a bit there. So definitely would be, you know, ideal. And I would put this uh, job on the dairy if, you know, once they get their colostrum, they, they, you know, let those calves sit for a little bit, maybe wait for, you know, a day. sometimes they can't do that, but it, it would really prove. I think would be really great for those calves if they could receive a bottle of electrolytes so that when they're placed at the, at the cow brewer, they do much better. Although we, you know, in during the summer season, we try to manage the dehydration as, as best as we can by giving them right away either their milk or electrolytes or IV fluids if they, you know, they come really dehydrated. What kind of transit distances are you seeing when you think about, you know, the hauling from the dairy to, you know, wherever these like day old or, you know, some of the data that like Idaho has done has looked at trucking for like two day old, seven day old and 14 day old. Because I think in the European Union, they can't haul cattle until they're at least 14 days mm -hmm. of age. That was part of their experiment. Um, and, you know, I've done a lot of work with transit stress, but of course our calves are 600 to 700 pounds and you know they have to stand the whole time because we don't want them to lay down and, and risk injuring each other um some of these calves that get hauled i you know see pictures and they're they're bedded so they can try to lay down and stuff but some of them what kind of what kind of distances are you seeing yeah i think it's highly variable depending on which where you go right depending on where it's pro pro profitable to feed those calves you can see calves coming all the way from the east to Idaho, right? So they'll get transport for many, many hours. Most 
I would say the people that have been successful at feeding these calves are people that are, are working with large dairies. And those large dairies are usually concentrated in states like Wisconsin, California, and Idaho. So they don't travel that far, right? They're usually picking up the uh, calves daily. And so it's a short distance. Although, as I said, there, there can be you know exceptions to that rule, especially in the depots and where they gather those calves from smaller dairies. Okay. So thinking again about this calf grower phase and an opportunity to set up calves for success coming into the feedlot. One of the things that strikes me is that calf growers historically have been growing heifers. And so they might've had very different production goals and they may have not even really had a production goal other than have said heifer alive by this day and you, you get paid a per diem or something mm-hmm. like that. Right. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. have you seen a, a shift in mindset for those who are growing calves to go into the feedlot to say, well, we actually want to get them up on feed. We want to get them to have a good rate of gain. Is there opportunity? I've seen some work like out of Purina where they were able to have dairy beef calves that were harvested by you know 14 months of age. So is there an opportunity to shorten up some of those days in the feedlot if we can get their average daily gain you know, kind of looking a little beefier <laughs> during mm-hmm. the calf grower phase? Uh, I don't know, to be honest. Um, so... I've seen, you know, both where there's people that are, you know, been raising replacement heifers that are keeping the the beef, the calves, the steer calves or the beef on dairy heifers and calves to themselves and growing them and then selling them at a, like, at a safeter, right? Like a, a couple, like 300, 400 pounds. Um, and I've seen people that just, you know, dedicate themselves to just raise people, uh, feeder, like calves to go to the feed yard. I'm not sure. So, you know, when you look at those uh, systems, you they usually keep the calves for about, you know, about 25, 25 weeks, right? So there's about a 70-day in-hutch phase. So they keep them individually in these hutches. And then after that, depending on, on the, what the market is doing and their capacity, uh, ideally longer than that would be, you know, a great strategy. Sometimes it's not possible given the constant supply of calves. They have to, you know, have somewhere they could put those calves. So uh, I think there's there's been some research done on the heifer side where they've proved that, you know, if you keep them in a larger hutch and you keep them in longer days in that hutch, that calf is going to perform much better once it gets to the pen. So I think there's opportunities in, you know, analyzing how are we keeping those calves in the first stage of those first five weeks until weaning. And then um, how can we manage them at the corrals? Pen density would be really important. Uh, bunk management. I think we oversee, and, you know, every, I'm not a nutritionist. I have to say that, right? You know that. But when I walk and I go to a calf grower, I'm like, somebody needs to be paying attention to these calves, right? We forget that they're growing and that they should have food in front of them and like a constant ad libitum. You know, we don't really manage a bunk or a bucket, right? They get a, you know, a bucket of grain in front of them. But sometimes those calves don't even, you know, they eat so fast. And this is a challenge with the beef on there. I mean, they perform much better. They grow much faster. Uh, they also eat more than you would expect, you know, the bigger, you know, than a hosting calves. And so they have to be set up for meeting those, you know, nutrition requirements and then having the space in the bunk for them to, you know, be able to eat. I think those strategies are going to, you know, prove to be beneficial once those calves get to, to the feed yard. Like, you know, you have to be strict for your bunk management, not because they're calves, You have to forget about, you know, having somebody looking over and making sure those calves have food in front of them and managing, you know, the the bunk. Yeah, I think it's just been so interesting for me because we've done a couple of dairy beef studies in the last year. And I would say um, actually both of them were specifically with disease things in mind, which it turns out works great because they really, really want to get sick um, in some cases before you give them the disease challenge, which is not great for the project. <laughs> and then results are all over the place and you're like, what the heck? <laughs> I know, I know. Like the calves that we had this summer on a metabolism trial and we moved them into the crates. And let me tell you, dairy beef calves are amazing to put into metabolism crates because they, you know, 500 pounds and you just kind of shove them in there yeah. and he's He's like, whatever. He doesn't try to kick. He's super chill. He doesn't go off feet at all. But three days before you try to give him BRD, he's already got BRD because he was like, ooh, that five mile truck goes like a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, those subtle, you know, um, handling events, they stress him quite a bit. 
Yeah, so interesting. So anyway, I guess I was going to say that I feel like I'm learning a lot about some of the nuances with dairy beef and definitely appreciating that the average feedlotter who has not had experience with the purebred Holsteins, for example, is not the one who should be, you know, sweeping up the dairy beef because, you know, they look like they're going to be an opportunity to make some money or something because there's just so many ways for it to go sideways. I would say, you know, take on the challenge, but make sure you have a supporting team and there's great, you know, companies out there that work together. I wouldn't just hire a, a veterinarian to work with you. You know, there's great consulting companies that ideally, you know, you want them to work together, like nutrition, uh, your uh, veterinary. So I wouldn't say don't do it, but make sure you have the setup, your kind of like support system so that you can maximize the revenue. And, you know, it goes uh, as easy as make sure that the bunks are at the level that they have to be. These cats are like small calves, right? So they are not going to be able to reach where your beef cats are going to eat. So make sure they're appropriate for them. Make sure the waterers, they can reach the waterers. I mean, it's just basic, ba- basic, basic setup. Another thing that we've learned with these caps is that they are um, affected uh, sever- severely by the weather. So when, you know, we have the winter here and same as Iowa, you know, we would bend the pens, we would put windbreaks or sh- uh, shelter and those calves would do, you know, beef calves would do really well, you know. These calves need extra TLC. Like they need a lot of bedding. They need more shelter than we've ever provided when they're really little. Once they get, you know, get fleshy, it's beefy, then, you know, they're good. But we have to pay a lot of attention to those basic details that you wouldn't probably think of if you were just feeding beef calves. So you don't have to do it alone. You know, find a team that's going to has experience or, you know, it's able to reach out and ask for, for help for those that have We've not been there, done that type thing. But yeah, definitely, you know, good stream of revenue. Just make sure you're set up for, you know, receiving those cows. I think there's going to be cool opportunities on the dairy side here. I actually have like an advisee this year who is from a dairy farm family in Wisconsin, and she's actually planning to go back and help them expand, moving into basically this ability to have their dairy beef calves focus on growing them and then whether or not they'll finish them, I'm not sure. But it's an opportunity where maybe the family farm wouldn't have been big enough for her to come back to Mm -hmm. that operation. But this is a new opportunity. So I think that's one of the great things about the ingenuity in agriculture as we figure out, you know, these new challenges and opportunities and stuff, it's going to be a way to maybe bring more of the youth back to the family farm. So that'll be good. Yeah, hopefully. And there's a lot of, you know, as anything pros and cons to anything, right? So one of the pros that I see with the beef on dairy is the uh, low investment. So in that scenario, I mean, they don't have to um, uh, keep up with the cow herd, right? I mean, the cow herd is already maintaining itself by producing milk and they're using a, a byproduct of that production, which is the calf. And then she, you know, she can use that calf to be, you know, manage the system and be profitable. But then you don't have that overhead of trying to, you know, feed that cow for a year and breed that cow uh, like we would in the beef, you know, in the beef herd. So that's one of the pros, you know, land use and then not having to, you know, the uh, upfront investment is not going to be there. Absolutely. Yeah. Maybe another opportunity for some of our young farmers and ranchers who are looking for an opportunity to get into the beef business. I worry about that with the way that prices have gotten right lenders are going to be a lot tighter than they might have been they might have remember what 2014 looked like and the fact that a lot of people are still trying to pay for the cows that they bought back then so you know they might have to be creative and think about partnerships with folks like dairies yeah absolutely i say if you like to gamble you're probably you know f- you know feeding some cattle it's a lot of <laughs> ups and downs in the market absolutely absolutely it's time for our famous three. Data shows most cattle don't get the vitamin D they need, especially in winter months. High D from DSM Firmanish can ensure your cattle get the recommended vitamin D level to support bone strength, help immunity, and improve performance. Visit dsm.com forward slash hy d to learn more. All right. Well, Mariana, I think we have reached that time in the interview where it's time for our famous three questions. Excellent. Okay. So our first question is, what is your favorite resource related to beef? Yeah. So um, I, I'm enjoying so much and I 
there's a lot of podcasts that have come out in the last two, two, three years. So I have a long list of podcasts that I uh, have saved. And so every time there's an episode, it notifies me. So every time I am um, uh, driving to work, every time I'm on a plane that, that, you know, it spends a lot of time traveling, anytime that I'm in the airport, whatever I, I am, I always, I'm always learning from the episodes and not only from, you know, the beef industry, because there's a lot of great podcasts out there, uh, but also from the dairy industry. I've learned so much uh, of what they've done uh, technology-wise, managing of people, you know, the challenges, and then again, the, the intersection between the dairy and the beef with these calves. So um, I try to keep a list and I will publish that. I, I'm active on LinkedIn. I put, publish a lot of things through LinkedIn. So that's one of the posts that I have, you know, saved there. I want to share, you know, my favorite podcast. There's quite a bit of them. Perfect. I love that. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn, I've really started to be a lot more active on there in the last year. And it's been really cool to see the different opportunities to connect with different segments of the industry and, and such a global opportunity as well. Crazy. Yeah, I know. I enjoy it so much. Collaborating. Collaboration sometimes start starts with a post. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm always surprised when somebody reaches out to me in my messages and they're like, hey, I saw you did this. We should talk about a research project or I'm looking for a student and I saw you post about one of yours. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like this networking platform is like good for networking. It is great for networking. I agree. We should use it more often. Absolutely. I know I encourage my grad students to make sure that they you know, develop a profile and, and manage that and things like that. Yeah, same. Okay. Okay, second question. Um, what is something not related to beef that you are reading or listening to or watching or otherwise consuming? Yeah, so I um, read enough uh, on my computer to, you know, be able, I know that people enjoy reading books. I am an active person, so I have a hard time reading, but I do a lot of uh, audiobooks. So I'm reading, I'm listening to this book called Range. I'm not sure if you, you heard of it. It's uh, the author is uh, David Ep Epstein. And it's a book that contradicts the uh, idea of Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hour. Uh, you know, you get specialized by 10,000 10, hours. So if he talks about why it is important to have both lateral and vertical thinkers and why over hyper specializing might be the exception and not the rule. So it brings back the idea of maybe we should, you know, try different things. Maybe we should learn about different uh, aspects. Uh, he talks about how, for example, it was mind blowing how like novel prices are people that are usually great at, you know, being creative. They're usually not just in their labs working all the time. They're usually people that, you know, are poets or painters, or they do all this, you know, different aspects uh, in their lives and that seems to be uh, beneficial to their, you know, the professional development. So I'm learning a lot, of, you know, from them and the ability to apply knowledge in broad situations. Hmm. Well, that definitely resonates as it's National Novel Writing Month here in November, and I'm working on finishing the draft of my second in my book series. And I like to think I'm pretty good in the lab too, but I, I totally agree with that. I think if you're all one thing all the time, it, it's easy to get burnt out in that thing. And if you can feed that side by having the creative side and bringing it back, and I do think it makes you look at problems differently and say, what's another way to, to solve that? So I love that. Yeah, I, have to check I out know that, that you're uh, deeply invested in your students and I, I would recommend that to the students. I think it would be a great resource, especially when you're in times like a PhD where you think this is all that matters, you know, and bring it back to, yes, it does, but there's other things that are going to bring value to your experience as a professional. And let's, you know, think about those things and how can they impact you know, in the future. Perfect. Okay. So that was Range by David Epstein. Epstein. Yeah. Epstein. Okay. Perfect. I'm going to definitely recommend that to them. We usually do a book club every semester. So we're reading Talk Like Ted right now. So. Oh, good. Exciting. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Third and final question. What's a trait of someone you know that you think has helped make them successful? Uh, I always admire the people that are able to pivot. I admire people that are flexible, um, that that, um, you know, in, in this life where, or in this industry, where I think it can be applied to anywhere where there's constant, you know, changing demands. I think the ability to quit something and uh, 
change uh, and use your experience in diverse subjects to apply it to and find different solutions. So being open to different ideas and apply those ideas, I think it's it's gonna you know make you a successful individual. That flexibility, ad- adaptability, um, and then you know be able to change. Right. I love that. I couldn't couldn't agree more. So pivot as uh, something that we all admire in some folks to be able to to change. Excellent. All right, Mariana, this has been so great having you back onto the show. And I didn't interview last time. So it was great to get to have this conversation with you here. And thanks to our listeners for joining us on this episode of the Beef Podcast Show. And we'll see you next time.